So where did Slant 3D come from? Well, in this video, we're gonna go through the entire history of how we built one of the largest print farms on the planet and where we're gonna try to go from here. So Slant 3D was actually created technically about late 2016, even though the company didn't exist at that point. Let me explain just a little bit. In 2016, I was running a company called Slant Concepts, which was a product design firm. We worked with clients and we created and designed their products and then got them into manufacturing. A lot of what we did were uh, robotics designs. So we did a lot of stuff in consumer robotics and home robotics, where we were doing kind of deep research and kind of the spree of machine learning at that time as well. That being said, over the weekend, one uh, weekend, I was messing around with a printer that I had available and I printed a small robot arm that was able to pick up a spoon and like move it around and something. I thought it was kind of fun. I programmed a little Python GUI so that it could be controlled and I brought it in the office and showed it to everybody. And the response was really good. Everybody thought, we got some spare time. We should try to productize this and do what we do and see if we can bring this thing to market. I was not interested in that idea. I had done it for fun. I did not want to 3D print these things and I did not want to go through the challenge of getting molds for this thing. Cause I was like, it's a STEM product, it's a niche product. It's not gonna be very big. But the guys got me convinced to go ahead and put it on Kickstarter. So we made a horrible like cell phone demo Kickstarter video, launched it and it was quite successful. It got funded. So we were now forced to create these 3D printed robot kits. The reason we didn't transfer into molds is because we still hadn't reached the scale to where molds were useful. And the design of that initial robot was garbage. It was awful. And uh, we, we knew that we were gonna continue changing and iterating on it. So we wanted to stay within 3D printing. So we were forced to stay inside of 3D printing. Printing was absolute garbage at that time. It, the machines were still really rough. Uh, they were not affordable. Uh, like it was still standard for like mini machines if you were like in cheapo ones to like be like solid metal beds, um, which was okay for PLA, but you could not print anything else on them. It was a really, really bad state of the world, especially compared to today, but it worked. And there was a seed of something there. And in doing and building those first kind of, that first run of robots, the, there were a few key ideas that came through. Number one, there, there was no reason that printing should be more expensive than molding on a per part basis. You have electricity and you have plastic going in. The fact that it's more expensive is a problem with the processes around it. It's not a problem with the process itself. But then there was the time. Well, time was easy to fix because printers were trending downward in cost. So if you wanted to double the speed of your print farm, well, you double the number of machines. And so long as the cost per machine was reasonable within that, not, oh, it's a half a million dollars per machine and we just doubled our capacity. Well, yeah, that is stupid if you're competing with molding. But if they're um, sub thousand dollar machines, then you're getting into the range of like a server farm. And even with thousand dollars plus, you're still in the range of the server farm. I mean, a rack and a server farm is a stupid expensive thing. And if we could match that model with printers, the printers themselves could be more expensive. So the speed was not an issue. But then there was part quality and part quality continues to be a thing. But we were a product design firm and within product design, you design for the process that you are using. Um, and no process is inferior. There's no such thing as an inferior manufacturing process. There are just different manufacturing processes. But if you design a 3D printed part to be 3D printed, it's much better than if you try to 3D print an injection molded part where it will be an inferior result. We have lots of videos about this on the channel. I encourage you to go take a look at those because we break down all of these topics in a lot more depth. But anyhow, those kind of three core ideas and solutions came to us and, and, and we recognized them inside of that original print farm. So we kept pushing on it. Uh, the little art bots were a successful product line, so they were able to cash flow uh, the continued development of like the print farm idea, which was a, a big advantage because we didn't have to build a print farm and hope somebody would use it. We were able to build a product and the print farm enabled that product. So after the little, the original little arm, we made the little arm V2, which was vastly better, so much better. It was a, it was a very good kit um, that again was designed with that philosophy in mind of like, okay, we're gonna print this. How do we design it to be most optimized for mass production printing? Little Arm V2 was a very successful product. We ended up putting that one into retail stores um, and and continuing to produce it with printers. Uh, we did another Kickstarter for it. We launched all of the little bots with Kickstarter over the next couple of years. We did I. I 
think 10 total robot kits were launched. Um, and we had a couple more in the can that we were gonna release, but uh, then COVID hit and it screwed the whole thing up. But about 2018, the print farm had grown to such a size that we were starting to have excess capacity because demand for the robots would ebb and flow with like Christmas and that kind of stuff. And when large orders would come through. So we had this excess capacity that we wanted to use. So we released the Slant 3D website, which allowed other people to have products quoted by us and we would produce them for them because why not? We were actually pretty good at it at that point uh, from having produced our own products. The chef had been eating their own cooking for quite a while. And at that time I was, I've been transferred from somebody who absolutely hated 3D printing to kind of the true believer uh, because it, it was so clear that there was an engineering roadmap to making it better. But we released that and we had great response. Uh, many of our first clients were very successful. There were guys like the Haddington Dynamics guys who were building high precision robot arms, had us 3D print the carbon fiber parts for them. Um, and then they ended up exiting, I think, for $26 million a couple of years later. A very successful uh, client there. And then a lot of other projects started coming through as folks realized that 3D printing was now able to hit scale and be affordable. Um, at that time, we were more cost effective than molding up to about 10,000 pieces. Um, and we were about 2017, I believe we crossed a hundred printers or so. We, we stopped keeping track of the number of machines pretty early on because it's not a useful metric. You look at the utilization as a whole and then like production output of machines, but like total number of machines is not useful because it doesn't really mean anything in the context of what you're making. So 2017 came around, uh, late 2018, uh, the team at, at Slant Concepts, we kind of, kind of finished most of our projects there. Um, and the team, the original founding team at Slant Concepts, uh, we kind of done all the stuff that we had wanted to do there. A, a lot of engineers have to go through and do the product consultancy thing uh, because it's a really good way to work on cool stuff. Um, but we were moving in different directions. So in 2019, Slant 3D was spun off and I became the CEO over here. And the guys ran with some of the other projects at uh, Slant Concepts. And we basically shut down that company. LittleBots continued on uh, as an independent business just operating until about 2020, where we uh, shut it down because supply chain was just a monster. It was impossible to get good servos. And the little arm bots at that time were really optimized around a very specific and very well controlled Metal Gear servo, so it, it fell out which is one of the joys of manufacturing is that you have all of these suppliers and all this variation within supply. We, we'd have an issue where, uh, so it's kind of a sidebar here, but with the little bots projects, uh, they were made around these specific servos. The manufacturer would change the mold of the casings of the servos and the tolerances on them would change by like a quarter millimeter. But since the little arms were all designed to be very product minimalist because you're able to do that with printing, they had very few screws in them and that kind of stuff. So a lot of stuff was press fit. But as soon as they changed the design of that casing and changed their molds, uh, our servos didn't fit anymore. So we'd have to go through and redesign all of our products, which was a pain in the tail. But in the context of manufacturing pains, we didn't have to redo our molds. All we had to do was update some files and that just reinforced how valuable 3D printing was to us. Within this time, we were bringing on a lot more valuable clients. We started doing stuff with like Amazon, uh, making promotional products and stuff for like warehouses and those kind of things. About 2019, 2020, we started doing work for like Walmart and those guys uh, making again stuff for like industrial use. Because industrial use is a really good application for 3D printing because it's a functional part, it doesn't do the job. And the idea of the layer lines problem doesn't exist there because a bracket doesn't matter. In 2020, we passed the 100,000 unit threshold and the 100,000 unit threshold was a big uh, milestone. Not only was it a nice number of zeros, but that is a quantity that very few real products ever actually reach. So if we could meet and exceed that, then uh, we were a legitimate manufacturing process for mass production. We've mentioned before that like Toyota considers 25,000 units to be mass production. Um, that's because very few products ever sell more than 10 or 20,000 units ever in their lifetime before they go bad. And we can back that up because <laughs> we've had a lot of clients over the years and very often they don't come back to us, not because they're unhappy, but because they just don't exist anymore, which is a brutal part of the business. But anyhow, so 2020, we were bringing in large clients, uh, 2020 hit, um, pandemic aside, 
Uh, it was great for U.S. manufacturing, and it was great particularly for our type of manufacturing because we were able to bring on clients for like bridge production. They're like, we cannot get this anywhere else. We're looking for options. So they were willing to try 3D printing for the first time. Um, so we were able to bring a lot of people on there and eventually get them transferred away from molds because as the pandemic ended, they were like, well, our molds are lost overseas and you guys are doing a fine job, so keep on making parts. Uh, so we had a lot of that kind of come through. From when Slant 3D started as like a division of Slant Concepts, it started out as a print room in about a thousand square feet. And we doubled footprint every single year. The large, first large space that we took, which was about 5,000 square feet, was for Print Farm Beta. And Print Farm Beta was spec'd out for 800 machines, 3D printers. At that time, it was gonna be the largest print farm on the planet. Prusa ended up catching up to us a little bit later that year. But Print Farm Beta was a very highly automated uh, system uh, it had pretty much all of the hallmarks of what our current systems do. Oh, side note, as far as the machines, a lot of people ask about our machines. We created all of our machines right from the start. And the reason we did that is because 3D printing printer manufacturers today do not design for mass production. They design for consumer use. And it's the, the difference between those two things is like the difference between a personal computer and a server box. We are making a server box. Everybody today and at that time is making a PC. A PC is no good in a factory. So uh, we had to design our own machines to be optimized for mass production. And within that, it's reliability, scalability, cost, um, and ease of manufacture. Because personal devices have a lot of guff in them that is not necessary inside of a factory. So we wanted to create a stripped down machine that we controlled because at that time printers were moving very quickly and continue to today. So we had to have control of our supply chain, which was also really valuable during COVID. So we built version one based off of a kit. I think actually that first kit was made by Flying Bear. The very first machines we had were Prusa clones. Those were the, the first like five machines that we bought and we immediately did not do that anymore. They were the horrible laser cut frames that snap when you screw them together. Uh, but then we uh, went to a, a box frame. The architecture was kind of good. The manufacturing of it was garbage because it was like all DIY machines, just garbage. So we took inspiration from that and built version one of our machines. Uh, within about six months, we got to version four. Um, today, uh, we are on version 14 of our production machines. And what we've been doing that entire time has been minimizing parts, improving reliability over time, and uh, making them more simple and reliable over time. So one of the big fundamental advantages of our machines is that they actually get better the longer you use them rather than get worse. Um, there, there's design tricks within the frames that allow them to settle rather than uh, allowing them to rattle apart like pretty much every other machine on the planet does. Print Farm Beta filled up and we, we ran out of space after a year and a half um, and the team was growing and everything else, it was not large enough. So in 2022, about 2021, we accepted the lease for a train factory. And this train factory was the, would become the Mega Farm, which is where we're in right now. The studio is in our office spaces inside of the Mega Farm. The Mega Farm uh, had the electrical capacity to power three to 5,000 3D printers continuously. Tons of juice in here because previously they were welding together trains. Um, so this opportunity came up and we had to take it at the expense of other opportunities. Our, our expectation was that in 2022, we would expand to our secondary factories, um, but we had to put those plans on hold um, because the mega farm absorbed so many resources and it was kind of a bird in the hand, two in the bush situation. But those other facilities are still coming. We'll talk about that in another video. But the mega farm came up, we moved in here in spring of 2022. And basically we now consider ourselves to be past the prototype stage. Our first facility, Print Farm Beta, and all the previous machines that we built over the late years and everything else, all of that was practice. And over this span of time between 2019 and now, where we've been a formal organization pursuing this, um, has been to increase the scale and accessibility of mass production 3D printing. And we've hit that. We're able to exceed molding up to 100,000 units. If people readjust their supply chain around 3D printing, you can go into millions of units and still be more affordable than molding. And then the scale of the mega farm 
is uh, so fantastic that we can have many clients in it all at once. And right now, all we're fighting against is the demand, uh, making sure that we're building machines quickly enough to keep up with the, the need for plastic stuff because this form of manufacturing that is on demand and reliable is very valuable to a lot of folks. The Mega Farm is going to continue to be built out over the next year or so um, to really fill it out uh, while at the same time maintaining all other projects. Inside of the Mega Farm, we have our filament production, we have machine production, we have post-processing, and then of course, all of the printers. Uh, we are not an invested company. We have always been fully bootstrapped. Uh, we want to change that in the near future because there's there's a lot of room to grow that we have not been able to exploit just because we are making sure that the business is sound and operational without having some kind of an issue there. Over the next year, we have a lot of stuff breaking loose. So we will have the release of our 3D printing API, which will allow anybody on the planet to access our print farm. Uh, basically, if you have a Shopify store, you'll be able to plug into the API and uh, get access to our printers. On top of that API, there will be a number of integrations to hopefully, again, make it very accessible. We have our filament production because we're able to do some really interesting stuff with that business model because we, we use all the filament inside of our facilities and the float of that, we can kind of spin off to other print farms to hopefully help other people grow and get the scale that is needed to continue growing printing as an option. But yes, the software is coming out. Uh, filament is coming out. Those are things that are coming along here. There's a few other things in the can coming out this year. But a lot of what we do anymore is working towards, okay, we've hit mass production. We are able to hit huge scale, which is hard to do, but it's not that hard to do. The really hard thing to do is to make one part out of the blue for the same cost as those 100,000. Can we make one part for 25 or 50 cents? And we'll talk about this more into the future and we'll expand on more of these plans coming down the line, but we want to allow you to print anything on demand out of the blue. So that's the history of Slant 3D up to date. Please stick around and we'll keep you updated on the things we've got coming down the pike over the next couple of years. And please subscribe to the channel for new information about how to get a product manufactured with mass production 3D printing. Have a great day, everybody.